you stupid bitch. Yeah, you're a stupid bitch, you stupid bitch. Welcome to this week's episode of Stupid Bitches Say What, the Aussie podcast about everything and nothing but always with wine and your host, Skyly Cullet. Mwee. And Sean Bino Hipkins. Uh, I forgot to add that bit in the first episode. What a stupid bitch. Ooh, <laughs> that wasn't supposed to go in the intro. <laughs> I did forget to fucking add our names you in the first one. Silly, dumb bitch. Stupid bitch. Stu- stupid. You silly pig. <laughs> Flowers. What is it? Cloud. Pigs don't wear flowers, or flowers don't make you pretty, or something. You yeah, silly you pig. silly pig. <laughs> now let me just find where. So today is the third. You haven't said your bit yet. Oh. This week it's pop culture. <laughs> Sky's favorite place. <laughs> Listen in as I cover the latest doco movies, Netflix sensation, the hatchet wielding hitchhiker, the guy that became an internet phenomenon and then convicted killer. While Skye discusses her love of the cry, the movie that starred Bruce Lee's son, Brandon, in what would be his breakout role, but he was tragically shot dead during a movie mishap, a.k.a. Alec Baldwin style. You're stealing all my content, you stupid bitch! I think everyone knows Brandon Lee got shot during the cry. I know that. You don't know that. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Do you know what I was just thinking as you were saying that, though, um, when we talk about this, <laughs> pigs don't wear flowers, you silly pig. Oh, yeah. um, the, do you remember the last season, or oh, it wasn't the last season, one of the, the later seasons of Game of Thrones where there's that meme of Jessica Lang and she's like, there's not going to be any elephants, you, you dumb st- bitch. No, you stupid slut, I think she yeah, says to her. that's right, it was. <laughs> you stupid slut. There's not gonna, but she, she doesn't say elephants. She says uh, they changed that for Game of Thrones. Yeah, that's thought, what I mean. It was the yeah. Game of Thrones memes that were going around at the yes, time. But that's she what says it that in was. Murder House. I think she says there's not going to be any pool, you sh- dumb slut, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, but what? they changed it to elephants because yeah. that's what's going on about the elephants or something. Right. <laughs> and I remember tagging you in it and just crying, laughing for <laughs> ages. Just going, oh, this is she so makes funny. an appearance in our New Year's posts every year all two years that we've been running, two years in a row. Um, The Jessica Lang doing that stupid bitch. (laughs) Love Jessica Lang, love her. Me too, me too. So what am I drinking? So what are you drinking, Sean Zeno Hipkins? Double podcast night, plus. Well, tonight, I think I'm drinking the one that you gave me. It's an engine room. Oh, yes. Was it a Cabernet saint Say it properly, Cliz. Was it a Cabernet saint say? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I believe it was a Cabernet saint 2022 McLaren Vale. I think when I was drinking it, it was a 2020 and also a 2021 barrel, I'll have you know. Ah, so you went cheap for me. Thank you so much. Well, no, that's all I got from fucking Pear Days. Um, I mean, not Pear Days, Naked Wines. Now you got me saying Pear Days. Um, but that's good Pear Days too, by the way. They Naked must keep cool. those barrels going because um, when I was drinking it, it was when I first started on the Nakeds and I think, which was 2021 because I was still mm. living in New South Wales. Mm. Um, on a and... recommendation from, did I give you a gift card for it? Yes, you, you did. I did. I got like a hundred bucks. I think I got my first car and my first box for about eighty dollars. Love that. Um, yeah, yeah. So you've definitely kept me in wine for the last two years. My pleasure. (laughs) And vapes. And for that, (laughs) yeah. Look, anything I can do to deteriorate your health (laughs) and make me look as old as you, (laughs) I'm willing to do it. (laughs) And what are you drinking, you dumb mole? 
Well, well, well. I'm drinking, and I think we've both had this a couple of times, but I think they've changed the label. Oh, well, that... It's a it's a little Jack, but I think it used to be a little Jack Horner. Oh yeah. Um, so it's it is Horner wines on the back, but they're calling it Little Jack. And look, he's look he's looking a little bit. Um, is he dirty. sat in the corner? He's, he's he's sat in the corner, but he's got his legs spread. Oh, he does. And what's coming out of his? It's a little a, bit sexual. Is that a stool leg or is that? It's a stool leg. Oh, oh what a boy! It's not a giant slong. <laughs> look who's here! I'll give it. A... Oh, hello. Hello, ladies. He's meowing at a mother's feet. My cat was around too just before, and then he realised the dog was in the bedroom, so he freaked out. And went downstairs. <laughs> oh bless! I hope if we ever got a dog, that the cats would love it. I don't think so, because the cats were there first. Yeah, true. And they've been it, here for eight years now. They'd be like, "What? What the fuck is this thing?" And especially <laughs> in this one bedroom apartment, they'd be like, "You motherfuckers!" You have to get a tiny <laughs> fucking dog. <laughs> A little French bulldog. Mm. So how's your week been, you dumb bitch? Look, the week has been good. I could have done this update in the last episode, but... You waited. We had so much more to catch up on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maths. Maths is back on our TVs. Have you seen any yet? You stupid bitch. So Tyler refused to watch it with me this week. We actually had a disagreement about it. Wow. Um, because he refused, just downright refused. How dare he? Yeah, He's married, you know. Yeah, exactly. At first sight. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So um, I haven't watched any. I'm desperate. I've seen a couple of snips from little vids on Instagram, etc. Yes. Um, looks riveting, I must say, riveting. It is. It's um. So we're still up to the fucking the weddings. The weddings, which I also find to be the most boring tedious part of the show mm, mm. but um they have given us some some quality viewing thus far yeah so we've seen so the don't probably, give me too but don't give me spoilers though because i am no gonna spoilers, watch it but there's um harrison the groom i'm sure you've heard about him if you've mm -mm. seen some of the stuff the one that i saw was the sister going off her tits about the dude that she was with and sat and going like you know just calling him every name under the sun the blonde sister and the and the, the, she's like the bridesmaid or something and then the sister's got brun brunette and she's she quite like pretty massive eyes yes she's the one who's married to harrison oh right so there's some fucking drama from the get-go that's marriage yeah. in the first episode there's the guy... sisters the sisters all like um he's obviously only here you know to be famous like and she's here to find love yeah, yeah. Like, and she's just going off her head and um, the sister's, like, crying, like, ah. It's It's hectic. It's very good. <laughs> There's a couple of nice ones as well. With God, this, I like, love the drama of it all. Tell me about it. There's this one couple, um, Lyndall and Cameron, and they're very lovey together, but they, like, Ugh. actually look exactly the same. Yeah, I know. I felt the same. I was like, eh, fast forward. <laughs> But there's some nice couples, there's some weird couples, and hold on to your fucking seats because we're going to have to do little discussions about this basically in every episode from moving I'll try, forward. I'll try and catch up when I'm hungers on Sunday. Perfect. That's when I'm going to be catching up on Australian Idol. <laughs> um, an Australian Survivor. Back. I, Bigger so, than ever. So Link and I have not been talking to each other this week. We've been had, had a little disagreement. I won't go into it. Um, but what about Survivor? No, no, uh. <laughs> just in general. We've made up, we've made up, we've moved on. Um, but, you know, teenage teenagers living in the house, you know, it's, it's grand. Mm. Um, so the whole point of this season was because he's in the sweeps this year that I was really looking forward to it being an activity that the three of us could do together, you know, of a night time during watch the week. Watch together, root for each other. So Tyler said to me a few times, let's watch it. And I said, no, not until... Link's watching it with us, so we've we've held off. So hopefully we can catch up next week because Jesus we're, Christ, we're friends again. <laughs> okay, well you're gonna have to be up to date by our next Friday recording, which is next Friday on both shows. That's a lot. That's a lot of TV, considering I'm barely watching an hour of TV a night because I'm so fucking exhausted. Oh please, you're drinking five beers or a fucking bottle of wine. What and watching TV? Medium, watching Medium from the oh, beginning. Yeah. yeah. Pause medium. That's the catch up. I love medium though. It's we my favourite show. We're going to be moment. way out of date when these episodes air and we're talking about fucking Married at First Sight at the season finale. Shh. 
<laughs> Hush, little baby. Um, and but I did have a question for you. Sure. Remember, you were getting those boxes delivered every month what of boxes? healthy shit. And oh yeah, I still get them. You still get them. You're yeah, I love it. them. So what's some um, some fun things you've got? Not like everything, just some shit that you've gone. Wow, this is whack or this is crazy, but it's cool. Look, I get some really good snacks and I got some really cool chocolates around Christmas time that were absolutely fucking delicious. And the bars that they sent me, like one time I got a box of, you know, like um, raw bars where it's like dates and nuts and things mm. like that. And it's all, you know, no preservatives, all that sort of stuff. They're delicious. Um, yeah, they are good, I, those bars. I get popcorn. I get a lot of the seaweed snacks, which Link loves, and he just devours them before I even get a chance. But I'm not a big fan of seaweed anyway. Um, but I did get some. I seaweed and I eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I seaweed and I smoke it. <laughs> That's like a dad joke, mate. Um, so this month, the box that I got this month. So what happened was it it accidentally reeked. So I got like a, a couple of freebies and stuff like that in the beginning, and then I forgot all about it, and it re like debited my account. So I paid another ninety dollars for three more boxes to come out. Um, yeah. But this, the one that I got, That's I do one very soon. Bucks for three yeah, boxes. yeah, it's okay. Um, but it had this little. So you know how like vegans eat that? Um, what do they call it? Something yeast, not concentrated yeast. Um, uh, and they they use it like cheese. They put it into stuff to make things taste cheesy. It's like a um, macronutritional. No, that's not it. It's something else. Cultivated yeast or something like that. Uh, deactivated yeast? No, not that. It's something. Anyway, so I got like this little salad topper and it had crushed up nuts and it was full vegan, full non-processed and you'd just put it on your salads. And sometimes at work, um, because I don't have lots of food options around me, I take like, you know, those microwave rices, but like the brown rices and the rices with beans and stuff in them. Yeah. The organic ones. So I take those and I put tuna in them and, I, and sometimes a little bit of veg, like sometimes some tomato and cucumber and stuff like that. But I was putting those sprinkles on top um, and they were delicious. Mm. But the problem was I had them one day and then put them in the fridge at work and then like had them, tried to have them like maybe three or four days later. No and good. then I put them on my food. <laughs> <laughs> like, tasted like shit <laughs> and that is the worst because you've already sprinkled it on your fucking yeah meal. so i had to like scrape it and push it to the side and eat the rest but when they were fresh it was delicious but it doesn't once you it doesn't open have the a long packet, shelf life no. one second <laughs> oh well you learn these things as you go along yeah it's like powdered <laughs> yeast or something like that anyway okay. i saw um, i just googled it the things that were coming up were nutritional yeast mm. and that's it nutritional yeast uh, that's the one yeah so right. it's like a powdery it's, it's sort of like the consistency of parmesan and i think it, you use it in place of parmesan right. so if you want that cheesy yeah. taste yeah you put it in stuff but um yeah so um Eat i've had a couple opening. of things like that but do you know the other thing that we're doing so since um and you'll find this really amusing well hang on hang on how's your week been okay <laughs> <laughs> so i I've obviously got a new job, which I talked about last mm -hmm. podcast, um, but it's also because I've done work from home for the last three years. I'm back in the office full time um, and I'm managing a whole bunch of people. So, you know, it's it's a lot of um, a lot of time and energy yeah. and long hours and things like that. And so quite exhausting, but loving it, loving the death out of it, but just a definite massive change to the lifestyle I've been used to being able to duck out to the shops in my lunch break and, you know, um, start dinner whilst I'm still working and you know catch up later if I've got errands to run in the middle of the day and stuff like that I can't do that at the moment so we tried to make a few lifestyle changes to support that it's not going well <laughs> <laughs> I've got so much shit that I like my sister rang me and said can we hang out on Sunday I said no mm -mm. <laughs> I said I'm already doing one thing on Saturday. I cannot cope with any more things. Yeah. I'm having to say no to so many things. Like I can I need do one to thing. Survivor and maths on one Sunday. One thing on the weekend. That is it. Um, with the podcast, with me being on the committee of the rugby club. Yes. <laughs> with the movie premiere. <laughs> I got anyway, shit going on. Have you bought so your tickets yet? 
No, I've organized who I'm buying for. And I messaged Kim and I said, I'm sorry. It's just, I was trying to get the crew together. Because you know what my parents are like? like? I'm buying tickets for them. So it's like, I've got to make sure they can't go online and buy them themselves because they're yeah. just special like that. Um, anyway, so we started getting diddly boxes. But, um, and it's actually been delicious. This week, the food that we've made from it has been amazing. And very different stuff to what we would normally yes, eat, which that's is a really cool like. thing. Yeah, that's what yeah. we love with the low fresh and that. You have shit you would never actually ever eat or cook yourself. Yeah. You're like, oh, that's so, quite tasty. Um, I'm sure Are you that, choosing your meals or are you just letting them select? Um, so I have gone with one selection, I think, most weeks, but generally I change them out for a couple of others, but still different stuff than what yeah. we would normally eat. Um, um, but the first week it came, so you know how you got to pick the delivery times, right? Yes. So there was a selection for this one where you could go from midnight till 6 a.m., and yeah. I was like, well, do you know what? That's actually better than us both being at work all day and it's sitting out in the sun. So even if it comes at midnight and we're asleep, like, you know, it's it's in the styrofoam or yeah. whatever they put it in now. They don't put it in the styrofoam anymore, but, you know, um, it's usually protected. So it can sit on your porch for a number of hours if you're not home. Like that's the whole point, right, for people who okay. work. Anyway, so it came, it was supposed to come at 12 o'clock at night between 12 and 6. So I get up at like 5 anyway. So I went to the front door to check it because I got the email, the message in the morning going, you delivered at least, you, you did at least come, blah, blah, blah. So I went to the door, brought it upstairs, opened it all up. They put one ice bag in it, and but it was sort of like lopsided when it was in the box. So the ice part had sat with the the pasta and the veg and stuff oh, and the no. meat had like sat down the other end and when I opened it the meat was hot no. because of, of the humidity and everything like that and then when I looked at when they delivered it they delivered it at 10 to 10 in the night time oh, and you could have gone down and got it then yeah yeah but I didn't realize I didn't check my phone I was actually still awake when it came but I didn't mm. they didn't I don't think they knocked you know what I mean I think they just leave it yeah they do yeah um Drop so <laughs> yeah, so that week we didn't buy any dinners because we were expecting this dinner to come and I was working like crazy hours. Um and I had to message them. I said, You guys came two hours early outside of your time, and also you put one ice packet in in a Queensland like yeah, Queensland heat. Like that's insane. You've got to put at least two or three in, like and did they and- they refunded yet? me straight away. They they gave me a full refund, which I applied to the next one, so that was fine. But and it did was you just... just go out and buy the rebuy the meat that you'd lost and still do it, or did you just abort the whole thing? We just did what we just made amends with what we had and mostly got takeaway that week and gave the meat to the dog. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to give Marley Spoon a go and then I'll probably go back and try Hello. I'll, I'll try them all. Do all the freebies. Like the yeah, best. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what I did then... for a while last year. Got the freebies off Hello Fresh, cancelled it. Marley Spoon cancelled it. Tinnerly. Yeah. And then they then contact think... you again when you've been gone away for three months and say, hey, come back. Here's some more yeah. savings. Well, that's it. And then I thought, you know what? It, with the Dinnerly, I could quite easily pay at normal price 100 bucks a week for three meals that I do not have to think about. Yeah. And it's good for Tyler because he loves stuff like that. Like he loves being able to make something off a recipe. Being creative. And, and, yeah, yeah. And doing it himself. Like, whereas I, I tend to struggle like making things from a recipe. I like to make things my own way. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> that's, that's a pass. Isn't it? <laughs> but Tyler loves it and I also got it in with the anticipation that I thought that Link would help out in the kitchen because I thought we're both working long hours I'd be like Link you're home from school why don't you go and follow the directions and you know at least prepare it for us but yeah that didn't work out and for that reason I'm out (laughs) anyway that's that's my part of the week that I wanted to share with listeners and viewers out there plus Hashtag, oh no, and make sure when you're ordering dinnerly to use the coupon code SBSW 40% for your 40% discount. <laughs> well, I've actually got 15 free boxes a month now because um, I've been through a whole cycle. So if anyone wants a free, free box. Boxes, huh? Oh, yeah, so you can give out to people. Yeah, so oh, yeah. they're the ones, if you've never had it before and you live so you can re-get them if you change your dress and change yeah, your yeah. email. <laughs> so just but, comment under the socials and Sky. Yeah, will you if you want a free, free box, box, I'll send you one plus. <laughs> um, but yeah, did we do how's your week for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Survivor and Maths. Oh, yes. Because, do you know, I was listening to um, one of our very early episodes the other day where you were really maggot from your Christmas party. Yes. And you kept going to me throughout it. So what are you drinking? And I'm like, I've already done me. <laughs> and then you do it again. So what are you drinking? <laughs> Whilst you were slurring your words heavily. I was trashed. You were trashed from the intro. That was 2021 like, me. It was, but the week before was me with Linda Chamberlain. Oh, that, Linda was that Chamberlain? Linda Chamberlain? No. So that was, so the next week I was on my best behaviour because. And I was fucking maggot. Of the trade wreck the week before. <laughs> but yeah, so I believe you're going first, you dumb bitch. I am. I am. So a new documentary movie doing the rounds on Netflix, The Hatchet Wielding Hitchhiker. Have you seen it yet? No, and I hadn't actually really heard about it. Like, I didn't even know that's what you were doing tonight. I was, I was quite surprised when I read the intro. I was like, oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, no. Benny and I went to watch it one night and literally... Were you doing something else, though? No. Oh, no, you said you didn't know what you were doing, I think you said to me. No. I said it. <laughs> And you said, isn't that more true crime? And I said, no, because it's kind of like a pop sensation. <laughs> <laughs> so Vinny and I went to watch it one night and literally about five minutes in, we were like, this dude is annoying as fuck. Mm. I can't deal with him for the next one and a half hours. So we flicked it off. Then the following Friday, I had seen another write-up about it somewhere and I thought, fuck it, I'll give it a go. So I finished it. And boy, oh boy, what a tale, please. So in a nutshell, and according to Netflix, this shocking documentary chronicles the happy-go-lucky nomads ascent to viral stardom and the steep downward spiral that resulted in his imprisonment. Um, There's some serious twists and turns in this guy's tale that you're like, what the actual fuck? So the hatchet-wielding hitchhiker, a.k.a. Caleb Lawrence McGilvery, who was born in September 1988, by centennial year. I hate hitchhiker stories because it always reminds me of all those, you know, urban legend stories about hitchhikers. Tap, tap, tap. Yeah, scratch, scratch, tap, scratch, 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 scratch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, also known as Kai, first became... Kai. What's Kai. his real name again? Caleb Lawrence McGilvery. Kai. How do you get Kai from that? Oh, you'll hear about that. Um, he first became known from the internet viral video kai the hatchet wielding hitchhiker featuring featuring him recounting featuring, a crime, featuring him my half your half <laughs> recounting oh the first of the season oh, no. recounting a crime he witnessed whilst hitchhiking like one of those and it became like one of those auto-tune vids that you see with people like you know ain't nobody got time for that that kind of thing do you know what i'm talking about ain't nobody got time for that that was and our so bitch what- run what did he say though? What was his catchphrase? So, in February 2013, <laughs> <Sorry>. jumping ahead, <laughs> Kai was videotaped giving an interview to local Fox affiliate KMPH TV, please. KMPH TV. <laughs> KMPH TV. <laughs> in Fresno, California. In the clip, he he described his part in an incident of a man driving his car into a gas employee. (laughs) Kai recounts, like a gas station employee, Kai recounts how he had been hitchhiking (laughs) and was picked up by this person named Jet Simmons McBride. So all the fucking double banger names here. A heavy set dude who, according to Kai, weighed about 300 pounds. How much is that in kilos, please? About 140k ish. Okay, sure. Apparently, this dude, McBride, claimed he was Jesus Christ and allegedly also confessed to Kai during the drive that he'd once raped a 14 year old girl while on a business trip in the Virgin Islands. Jet then crashed his car into a pedestrian at an intersection, pinning the pedestrian against the rear of a parked truck and the front of his vehicle and the front of the vehicle he's driving. The guy who confessed to yes that he was that picked up Kai, right? Okay. Kai, Kai then says how he jumps out of the car to help the pedestrian while the driver remained in the car. When a bystander arrives on the scene, Jet jumps out of the car and starts attacking her by putting her in a bear hug. Sensing the woman's life might be in danger and believing the man could snap her neck, quote like a pencil stick, 
Kai pulls a hatchet from his backpack and repeatedly strikes Jet McBride in the back of the head. You do, as you do. In the video, Kai describes the hatchet blows with the words, Kai describes the hatchet blows with the words, smash, 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 while he reenacts over the head swings. Oh my God, reenacts over the head swings. Smash, smash, smash. And he gets to go. Red wine will do that to you, Puzz. Gets the girl free, is interviewed by the police quickly afterwards and let free. He's a hero. The video was uploaded, so he's done an interview telling people this is what he'd done to KPMPH TV. And the, vid- and the video is uploaded to YouTube on February 2nd, 2013 by Jesse Raisbeck, the guy who conducted the interview. Can I interject just momentarily? Sure, why not? Um... Who carries a hatchet? And is a hatchet's like a small axe, isn't it? It is, but this one was very blunt. Like a, like a handheld axe. Yes, 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 like a tomahawky type thing. Sure. So sure. He, it's quite blunt. So when you see the guy's gashes on his head, they haven't like gone straight through the skull or anything. It's like sort of like a blunt weapon that he's done it with. He's almost worse. Doesn't <laughs> it? Well, it didn't slash straight. Brain damage. <laughs> As of January the 14th, 2023, so this year, the video has now got over 8 million views. Ooh. It's been automated many times. It's a meme, Dallas. And as a result of the viral nature of the original video, Kai received extensive offers from various news and entertainment sources seeking interviews and appearances. So there's so a this- video of him bear-hugging the girl and no. him, no, it's just him attacking the guy with the hatchet. No, so the videos of him giving an interview describing what happened. Okay, so no, like, okay. Gotcha, you don't see gotcha, that, gotcha. Yeah. So, so the video was uploaded in 2013. Um, it became this huge media sensation and he started getting offers for interviews and appearances, including a spot on Jimmy Kimmel Live on oh. the 11th of February. So this is fucking nine days after it was uploaded. He's now getting a video... Uh, Spot on Jimmy Kimmel Live. 2013. Yeah, just over a week after the incident. So this guy is literally just blown up on social media. The attention must have been insane for him. He's a homeless hitchhiker. He was approached by Justin Bieber's team about a music collaboration um, because he plays guitar and sings as well. And a Keeping Up With The Kardashians producer wanted to create a reality show about him. The day of the Jimmy Kimmel recording... America. (laughs) The day of the Jimmy Kimmel recording, he gets kicked out of the Hollywood's Roosevelt Hotel for skateboarding in the lobby and gets gets in trouble for peeing on a sign in front of the Jimmy Kimmel studio. Sure. He then makes his TV debut. During the show, there's more weird interactions with him and Jimmy Kimmel, like you can just see this guy's nuts, including a hitchhiking skit. He's also gifted with a surfboard and a wetsuit of 500 and $500 cash by Kimmel. And he promptly gives the cash to the security guard and apologizes for peeing on the sign outside. Kimmel asks him, why did you have a hatchet in the first place? Well, if he's which- homeless, sorry, I missed the bit about him being homeless, I guess, because um, I, get, I get it. He's protecting himself. I understand that. Well, so the reason why Kai says to him he has a hatchet is I was... Tra- I was- Oh my God, Tredying. I was trying to do this really cool ass tree house with willow hooks and I was going to make a dream catcher out of it and put wood planks on the floor and then have another little hoop above with the chains dangling down beneath that one to the tree so I could drape tarps across that and on the inside have like some bed sheets with moss in there for insulation. You could put like a crab trap there inside of a hot water tank heater, right? <laughs> Kimmel says to him, so you're going to do all that with a hatchet? What is this, some <laughs> some magical hatchet that you wave and contractors appear? <laughs> and Kai replies, no, I'm just a badass motherfucker. So Ooh, you can okay. tell you can tell this guy has ADHD, but I and I don't really know the terminology for it, but like a really strong case of ADHD, right? Like, so one of the ideas that the producers have to try and keep the Kai dream alive was to have him do movie reviews, um, but they can't get him to sit still and watch a movie in full, so they give him just the trailers to watch, and he still can't even sit there for two minutes straight and watch the movie preview. He's like <laughs> up in his chair and running around and shit. So that mo- that idea is scrapped 
<laughs> if his stories are true, he had a pretty tough upbringing, saying that he was raised in a fundamentalist Christian cult, that his parents had been divorced and that he had been molested in his youth. Mm. He also stated that he had took on the name Kai after taking part in a spirit walk while living on a Native American reservation. He makes claims that he, locked, he was locked in a cage for four years as a child. He wasn't ever allowed outside to play with the other kids. His mum had blackened out the windows of his room so he didn't know it was still light out. Shit like that. Mm. Mother responds in the documentary by saying there was a short period when she took measures to stop him from getting up so too early so he wouldn't get into stuff that could harm him when he was very young. She doesn't specify what she actually did, but she says she never locked him in a room. He was also sent to a home for wayward kids at 13 after trying to set the house on fire. <laughs> prior to the Fresno incident, so prior to the fucking smash, 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 Kai had been living a transient, living as a transient, which he described as, uh, quote, home free. So he wasn't <laughs> homeless, he was home free. He did not have health insurance, a social security number. I really like that. <laughs> I'm home free, bitches. Home free. <laughs> as free as the wind blows. <laughs> as free as the grass grows. <laughs> I'm Continue. Home free. So he didn't have health insurance, a social How's security. How's that sound, Gervaisi, going for you? Do you love it? Yeah, it's very tasty. It was better than the other one. Um, there definitely was black pepper taste notes. The one the you were drinking before, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, the Sangiovese is a good drop. It is. It's definite. And I've never heard of it prior to our podcast. But remember I got you that really nice bottle for your birthday too. I think it was last year. It was had like the um, embossed mm. label and it was a Sangiovese. It was like a weed bottle, remember? Yeah, it was delicious. Yeah. It's a good grape. Sangiovese is delish. Sangiovese all the way, see. So he did not have health insurance, a social security number, a driver's license, a passport, or any form of identification. And how old was he? Ooh, I think he's like 20, he was about 22. So he was born in 1988, and it was 2013, when it, so it was 25. And he didn't have a social security number. No. <laughs> I mean, you could forgive him for not having a driver's license or a passport. But the social security insurance. is like a big so, thing in the States. Isn't that's it? like, like that's our that's tax whole, file number. Yeah, yeah. that's like yeah. everything that you need to actually be a person. <laughs> exactly. That's your identity. Yeah. So speaking of home free, have you ever seen the movie Nomadland? No, I actually haven't. So Frances McDormand, do you know her? Yes, I love went, her. Yes, she was in that three billboards outside of it. Love been, been her. that, right? Have you seen that? Three billboards? Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. Dark, the, dark, the, but the ending was um not, not very satisfying yeah <laughs> yeah but it was a good movie so she's in this amazing one. movie and she wins she won the because she won the best actor for three billboards and then she wins this one for nomadland the year after i think she also won for fargo too yes that's right yeah yeah, yeah. so she's won a few but uh, billboards outside of mississippi was a fucking ace movie but yes it was it made you laugh it made you cry it made oh you go, when she kicked the chick in the cunt <laughs> <laughs> is that where she goes and just boots a chick in the vagina yeah like yeah. and it, you actually sometimes laughing so hard and you're like i should not be laughing at this considering this is actually what's going dark on. <laughs> well this movie nomadland is completely different to that um but she wins the best actor again she has so have you seen no man yeah no yeah Madeline? i've watched it twice i think we went to the cinema to see it and then i watched it um, oh, we're always home. looking for movies. Where it's so hard to find good movies these days. So I'll put that on my list if that if it's that good. Yeah, no, I I really enjoyed it. It's so she the difference with her and Kai is she actually had an identity. So she had a social security number and a license and all that shit. But yeah, it's really interesting that there's this whole culture, and I'm sure this is in other countries, but this is just focusing on the US um, of people who just get in their camper van and drive the country as the and that's their home. They don't have an actual house. They're home free. Um, and like every now and then, like every Christmas, she goes and does a shift at Amazon factory and gets her money. And then she goes and they have little meetups, all the different people in the camper vans talk about um, ways that you can clean your toilet more better in the camper van and like all to 
hints and tips and shit. It's a very easy watching movie. There's no huge twist or drama filled events or anything like that. It's just a nice life movie. Totes mm. recommend it. Have you ever seen that one with Reese Witherspoon? Um, where Wild. She goes hiking on the trail. Wild. Yeah. No, I haven't, but I, oh, yeah. See, that this movie to me is in the same vein as that. It's like this is sort of nature movie. I but note for myself because we've been trying desperately to find new movies lately. I'm going to just watched- make a note. I watched um I've watched Wild a couple of times too. It's just so it's it's a movie you want to watch when you don't want to watch anything fucking dramatic. You just watch yep. it. It's just a good story. So, anyways, barely three months after Kai went viral, a 73-year-old lawyer named Joseph Galfi was found beaten to death in his underwear Ooh. in his New Jersey home. Here we go. The next day, Kai posted on Facebook. So he had Facebook. What would you do if you woke up with a groggy head, metallic taste in your mouth, in a stranger's house, walk to the mirror and seen cum dripping from the side of your face, from your mouth, and started retching and realising that someone had drugged, raped, and blown their fucking load in you? What would you do? So he made that post the day after this guy's body had been found. While searching the crime scene, police find a piece of paper and a phone number that said Lawrence Kai. Investigators Googled the name and came across Kai, the hatchet-wielding hitchhiker, and wonder if it had anything to do with the case. They also found a train ticket at the scene, which prompted them to check surveillance footage at that station, where Galfrey, the victim, is appearing on the um, surveillance footage handing a ticket and hugging this guy who from the back looks a lot like Kai. So Kai at the time had long hair and then he'd wear a bandana over the top of it, not like tight in, but like sort of just loosely over the top and tied at the back. So he was very, he has a distinctive look. Once detectives released his name and picture, it only takes a short time time for authorities to catch up with him and they find him at a Greyhound station in Philadelphia. He'd cut his hair but investigators had seen the photos of his new look taken by a girl that he'd met on Facebook and hung out with. Talking to the investigators, Kai said that he was hanging out in Times Square in New York when Galfi approached him and offered him a meal. They ended up eating takeout and watching TV at Galfi's house, and he spent the night. When Kai woke up, he said he felt like he'd been orally raped. Galfi then bought him a train ticket the next day, as had seen on surveillance, so Kai could go and meet some friends. But after his friends didn't show up to meet him, Kai then called the um, Galfi back and asked if he could come back to his place. Galfi made after burg- he woke up with the cum in his mouth. Yes, uh, allegedly. Galfi made burgers and they drank a few beers. And then at some point, he says he woke up on the floor to find Galfi in his underwear trying to pull down his pants. This is when Kai apparently just snaps. He states that he didn't doesn't exactly know what happened or what he did, but he said that Galfi must have hit him in the head first. Though the internet was still ablaze with debates over whether Kai did it or not, complete with a free Kai Caleb Lawrence change.org petition, and with Kai maintaining it was self-defence, he is ultimately charged with murder. The police claimed the sexual encounter was consensual and the murder premeditated. However, Kai said he had no need to have sex with men like Galfi, whom he described as unattractive, stating, do you know how many hot chicks? Never mind. Even if I was gay, do you know how many hot guys wanted to fuck me after that shit in California? I'm not even being vain. It's just a fact, like, no offence. But he, Galfi, was not a looker. What I think happened is that maybe Galfi's offered him money to have a bit of a servicing or whatever to get freaky. He's accepted it and went back, done it, fucked off the next day, but went back to do it again and maybe freaked out or something. Yeah. So he was imprisoned for over five years, waiting for the trial to begin, which began on April the 1st, 2019. So it takes, imagine that, just waiting for your trial and being in prison for five years before it even happens. He's found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to 57 years in prison. He is to serve 85% of that term before the possibility of parole, including the time he'd already served, with the judge telling Kai, when you become eligible for parole, you will still be younger than McGalfie, than Gal- Mr. Galfi was when you murdered him. Galfi was 73 at the time of his death. 
He has since appealed the conviction, alleging 15 instances of misconduct, abuse of discretion and ineffectiveness of defence counsel. Mm. But the murder conviction was upheld in, in August 2021. He was also reported, um, he has also responded to the documentary, mm-hmm. claiming he has been ruthlessly exploited by Netflix because he wasn't paid for the story. He says... So Netflix is making a movie about my life story before I was arrested, but they refused to pay me anything for it. If someone made a movie about OJ Simpson's football career, you'd better believe he'd be making bank off it. He said, guys who kill and rape women get money for their pre-arrest fame, but I saved women from being killed and allegedly killed a rapist, so Netflix is ruthlessly exploiting me. What the fuck? which is wrong because, I mean, all the stuff they're using is stuff that's on the internet that they found and interviewing other people. OJ was They're still collating it in a way that they are exploiting him, though. But also OJ was never found guilty. So OJ could sell his story. I'm not saying he was or he wasn't. He was never found guilty in a court of law. So he, he has the right, right to sell. He found, and, no, he was found later on not guilty, but um, had to pay damages. Even yes, he to the family. Not guilty. Yeah. So <laughs> How he's the fuck able does to, that work? He's, he was able to sell his story. So it's sort of chalk and cheese in that sense. Mm. But to wrap it up, please, what happened to Jet McBride, the guy Kai smashed with the hatchet? Mm. Well, when Jet went to trial for the attack, Kai was, wasn't available to testify in person at the month-long trial, but prior, prior comments he had made about the incidents were also allowed in evidence. So the court tried to swear him in, but he keeps raising his left hand instead of his right when they're saying raise your right hand. They finally get him to raise the correct hand and he says, I could see he was going to grab her and I grabbed the tomahawk from inside my bag. I looked at him and I says get the fuck away from her. (laughs) In January 2014, Jet was found not guilty of attempted murder, but was convicted of two counts of assault with a deadly weapon for hitting both Neely and another worker with enhancements of using a car as a weapon and causing serious injury. A jury subsequently determined, however, that he was not of sound mind when he committed the crimes. The Netflix doc notes that he was sentenced to nine years in a mental health facility, but his defence attorney says after the film premiered that his client was actually remanded to a state hospital where he ultimately served four or five years and McBride is currently a free man. Oh, God. Three weeks after going viral, Kai was back in Fresno to perform at a club. Oh, yeah. So this is just more about McBride. So three weeks after going viral, Kai had apparently gone back into California to perform at a club when he was allegedly told a musician and others that he had slipped Jet a lace joint soon after which the driver freaked out and attacked those people while they were smoking it. But a toxicology report found there was nothing but marijuana in McBride's system. So it just right. shows that anything that Kai has said, as charismatic as he was, is just completely unreliable. But I totally reckon, even though I've given away so much of the story, there's so much more in it to watch. It's just fucking like, oh, my God. So what do you think? Do you think that he's just like th- completely unstable and capable of killing at will? Yeah. I or think hurting com- people at, at will? I think he's completely unstable. I don't think that he was date raped by this guy. I don't know why you would go back and hug a guy after you'd woken up and found cum on your face if you'd been orally Mm, raped, why you'd be hugging him and getting a train ticket off him. I think it was consensual. If anything happened there, he was ha- he allowed it to happen, maybe for a dollar and a free meal. Mm. And he had a moment, didn't he? He had like a spell where yeah. something switched in him, like he just went, you know. Why am I letting some old dude do this to me? I could have young hot guys and fucking young mm. hot women and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Oh, I totally want to watch it. Yeah, it's good. It's interesting. So what have you got now for your, for your cry? So... The Crow. First of all... No, it's more... um, (laughs) Have you you haven't watched Schitt's Creek? You haven't watched Schitt's Creek yet, though, have you? Not all of it, no. Because there's a a massive chunk about not the movie The Crow, but about crows in it that every time I, like, they reference it in Schitt's Creek, I think of this movie. But anyway, (laughs) you have to watch the whole of the season, like, all the seasons of Schitt's Creek to understand that reference. But anyway... Um, so what do you know about The Crow? And most importantly, have you seen it? 
I think I saw it when it came out in 93. When did it come out? 94. 94. 94. I think I saw it like when it first came out on video. Mm, I remember something I didn't see do... it at the... Oh, actually, no, I think I may have seen it at the cinema. I'm pretty well, sure it, I did it, see it at the cinema. It had so much fucking um, publicity around it based on what happened. But mm. I, I think I remember something about morphine, someone being addicted to morphine. In it, yes, yes, that's part In of it. the plot line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he turns into a crow. It's not as basic as that. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I remember. <laughs> but please enlighten me, dear, dear, um, dear co-host. Okay. All right. So, um. So obviously you know that he dies on set. But back in the 90s, it was like the biggest conspiracy ever, right? Yes. The Curse of the Dragon. Yes. So The Crow is based on a comic book and not only is it an amazing film and it totally holds up in this day and age because I've seen it multiple times over the years. I've showed it to Link. Link was like, what? This movie is insane. And I was like, I know. Wow. Um, But it's incredibly dark. Like the majority of it is black. Yes. There's no daylight at all yeah. it's all very dark movie like it's that kind of film yeah um but it's so it's an amazing film it also has a, dark, a huge dark story behind its creation and release due to the um untimely death of brendan lee son of kung fu legend bruce lee at the age of 28 so it came Bless. yeah so because when i was doing i was like oh my god he was in the 28 club but it's 27 it's the 27 yes, club right? right um so it came out in 1994 the year I was 14, so you can you can imagine my obsession because he was, like, so dreamy. Um, and the story behind it was so shocking and unbelievable that I was not only obsessed with the movie because it was amazing, but obsessed with him because he was so gorgeous and obsessed with the fact that he died on the set of the film. And I was just like, you know, it was one of those things that you become, when you're a teenager, just so obsessed with, like, completely and, and utterly. It oh, was it was gorgeous. AF. Gorgeous. Yeah. Um, so... It's listed as a superhero movie, which I'm like, eh. Um, but I guess the comic book was, you know, written in that sort of theme. Um, yep. But I'd really describe it as a goth film. It was written, so the film was written by David J. Show and John Shirley, but based on John O'Barr's comic of the same name. Right. So the plot, it's, it's Devil's... Thickens. It's, it's Devil's Night in Detroit. So Devil's Night is like a made-up holiday, sort of like Halloween-ish. Halloween. Yep. But it's because the the fictional place, it's in Detroit, but the fictional town or the fictional situation that it is, it's like a it's like a, a different universe. It's sort of like... Yeah, um, Gotham City being New York yeah, and stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's Detroit, but it's like a, a different universe. Um, but so Devil's Night is like a Halloween thing where basically all the really, you know, um, the criminals come out to play basically. So, right. you, you you know, don't go out on Devil's Night because then there's fires everywhere and all this crazy stuff happens. So it's a very dangerous night to be out in Detroit. But I think, and look, to be fair, I don't really know a lot, but I think Detroit can be quite a, um, you know, unsafe city. Yeah. There's, like it's not, you know, one of the safest places to be in certain parts, I'm sure, but that's probably my ignorance showing there. Sorry, American people, if I'm wrong about that. Um, but so Police Sergeant Albrecht, who is played by Ernie Hudson from, you probably know him most commonly from Ghostbusters fame. Yeah. Um, love him. He's one of the best actors and I just adore him in anything that he's in. So who he, is it, sorry? Um, so Albrecht is the character, but it's played by Ernie Hudson. So he's one of the guys from Ghostbusters. So yeah. just in heaps of, anytime you see him in a movie, he's always like this amazing character that you yes. just totally love. Um, so he arrives at a crime scene. A young woman named Shelley Webster has been raped and gravely wounded. Her fiance, rock musician, Eric Draven, cool name, uh, was killed in the attack, having been shot and thrown from the window of their loft apartment. So that whole piece that's shown in the film is very symbolic and really brutal to watch. Yes. So it's quite a brutal movie. Like, it's very it's very violent. Um, so... Well, it's Devil's Nat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so as he leaves for the hospital with Shelley, this is Ernie Hudson, the police sergeant, um, he meets a young girl, Sarah, who Shelley and Eric looked after. He confronts Sarah when he she realizes that Shelley is going to die 
from the injuries. He, oh, sorry, he cut he comforts Sarah when he realized that Shelly's going to die from the injuries um, because Sarah's really distraught. She's only a young kid, very close with them. They weren't related anyway, but she has come. Or, yeah, yeah, she's come at the moment when it, the ambulance is there and everything like that, and Eric's already dead and it looks like Shelly's going to die, which she does. Um, so one year later, Sarah, the kid, visits Shelly and Eric's graves before meeting with the police um, Sergeant Albrecht, who now helps take care of her. So she has a really terrible home life. Her mum's a drug addict. She doesn't really have anyone. She's a you know, single child. Um, and he's sort of like taken her under his wing. A crow lands on Eric's gravestone and flaps on it, resurrecting him. Upon returning to the now derelict apartment, Eric experiences flashbacks of the murder when a gang. So Eric is Brandon Lee, is it? Yes. Uh -huh. So he, so the movie starts with him being killed and thrown out of a window. He yep. dies a year later. The young girl's visiting the graves. A crow lands on his gravestone. She leaves and everything like that. And the next thing, like, Brendan Lee is resurrected, right? Yep. So he has doesn't really know what's happening. He's, like, confused. He's, like, what the fuck? Um, goes back to the apartment. And then as soon as he goes back, it's completely derelict. No one lives there anymore. Mm -hmm. It's, like, run down, you know, boarded up. Yeah. Um, and as soon as he enters, he experiences flashbacks of the murder. Um, and remembers everything. So the gang, T Bird. I remember the apartment, yeah. Yeah. So T Bird, Tintin, Fun Boy, and Skank broke in. <laughs> I'd be Fun Boy, you'd be Skank. <laughs> <laughs> so they broke in and attacked him and Shelley due to them protesting forced evictions in the apartment building. So there's, there's flashbacks, so there's heaps of flashbacks to the film, but basically they were being evicted from their apartment. It's a really run-down, you know, part of the city. People are really poor. They started the petition and got people to sign on, but they were heading the petition saying, you can't evict us, we've got nowhere else to go. You know, there's no reason for us to evict us. We haven't done anything wrong. Yeah. Stop it. Um, Stop it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eric also discovers at that time that any wounds he receives heals immediately, right? So he's like, look, he picks up a piece of glass, I think, from memory right. and he cuts himself, but it just heals straight away. Um, guided by the crow who resurrected him yeah. and whom he shares a telepathic connection, he sets out to avenge his and Shelley's murders. Ah. So the crow helps Eric locate Tintin, the first of the bunch. So there's four of them, yeah? Yeah. Um, who Eric stabs to death. Eric, and look, they, uh, there's so much detail in the murders of these four people as it happens. Um, you've really got to watch it because it's it's one of those movies, like even though I don't like gruesome stuff and I really hate violence, like for the sake of violence, it's very satisfying to get see of these course. horrible people yes. get, get what's the, coming. And it's very and... Um, like inventive how they each die. It's not like he just kills them, like he kills them in a very vicious manner. Okay. That, yeah. Um, anyway, so, um, so he stabs the first guy to death, right? But there's a way more to it than that. He next travels to the pawn shop where Tintin, the first guy that he had killed, pawned Shelley's engagement ring, forcing the owner, Gideon, to return it. And again, that's very intense, that scene. He blows up the shop but spares Gideon so that he can warn the others and he basically says, I'm coming, tell them I'm coming for yeah. you. Um, he then tracks down Fun Boy, who is having sex with Sarah, the little kids, a strange drug addict mother, Daria. This is the bit that you remember. The morphine. Yeah. yeah. So Eric kills him, making him overdose on his own morphine stash. Again, incredibly graphic murder <laughs> scene that happens there. And confronts Daria, Sarah's mother, making her realise that Sarah needs her. Um, so that's the one where basically he forces her in front of the mirror and then just holds up yes. her arm and yes. pushes all the morphine out yes. running down that's her arm. And remember. he's like, take care of your daughter. Yes. Yeah. You know? Oh, he speaks a little bit more like he speaks sort of in riddles as well. Like he doesn't just say that. Like he, I can't remember exactly what he says, but he speaks in riddles and basically yeah. says something about a mother you know, being the most important thing to a child and blah, 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 blah. Sort your shit out. Exactly. Um, so then, so hang on, sorry, because I'm not wearing my glasses because it's so fucking hot. Um, so 
In the meantime, Top Dollar, the crime boss of the Detroit. The top, um, top Dollar. Top I Dollar. I, yeah. I know the names are crazy, right? Because it's from a comic book too. So it's got that real comic book feel about it. Yeah. Um, so, so Top Dollar, the crime boss, controls the street gangs in the city. And his lover, half-sister, Merkra. Oh, God. Merkra. Half-sister. Yeah, it's super gross. Um, they've become a, aware of Eric's actions. They kill Gideon after he reports his attack on them. So Gideon goes straight to the crime boss and is like, this crazy guy came in. He's all bandaged up because, like, Eric's fucked him up as well to send a message. And then he tells them and they're like, whatever, and then they kill him. This is the pawn shop owner. So Eric then visits the police sergeant, explaining who he is. The police sergeant tells him that he watched Shelley suffer for 30 hours before dying. So she was raped and beaten horribly. Awesome. And after that, like gang raped, um, she still died. She, she held on for 30 hours but died, and he stayed by her side the entire time. Mm. Eric... Eric touches the police officer Albrecht and feels the pain that Shelley left. So he grabs oh. hold of him to see what he witnesses and is just like completely just, you know, blew it. Like he's just yeah. beside himself. Um, upon leaving the police chief, um, Eric saves Sarah, the little girl from being run over by a car and gives a, her a clue to that his identity before disappearing. So he sings some, some, words of a song that um, he would have sang that he way. that he mumbles well he was he was um a music he was a musician so yes, when they used to look after her yeah. um he used to sing all these songs and he had a record deal and records and stuff that were coming out and so she's like oh my god and it was like a song That's that true. hadn't been released like and she's like what the fuck so Eric then kidnaps T-Bird. So this is the second guy, kills him in an explosion. Um, the next morning, Sarah and her mother begin repairing their strained relationship after the whole meth thing comes out of her veins yeah. and she tries. Um, and Sarah visits Eric at the apartment. So Eric's sort of still staying at the, um, the run-down apartment. Abandoned house, yeah. Um, so Top Dollar's right-hand man finds Eric's grave is empty. Um, and then they hold a meeting with all their associates. So these are all the big crime bosses who pretty much run Detroit, the version of Detroit. Yeah. Um, and they discuss their plans for Devil's Night's criminal activity. So the whole point is for them to rob banks and make as much money on this night because the police are so scared to go out. It's kind because... of like, have you seen the movie The Purge? I haven't, no, it's but like I know the premise yeah, of it. Where there's no rules, basically. Everyone yeah. can do whatever they want. That's exactly what it is, pretty much. Yeah. But, the, you know, they it, already the city is overrun with it. Again, a bit like Gotham. The, the city's overrun yeah. with crime and police can't even make a dent in it sort of mm. thing. So why go out on the craziest night ever? And try and um, stop anything, yeah. So Eric arrives looking for Skank and a gunfight erupts. Skank is killed during the fight. So Skank is one of the four. So we're, we're down to... Is Skank a guy or a girl? Skank is a guy. They're all men. Oh. So, so we've got one left. Three of them are gone. Skank's left. Um, so Top Dollar and Big Micra, the, the, the sister lover, um, and Grange, his right-hand man, escape. Um, and Micra, so she's like this real gothic, weird chick. She figures out because the crow's flying around during all their interactions that the crow is part of his power because they know he died like they know who he is and they know that he died over a year ago um and they she theorizes that if they kill the crow they'll kill eric yeah he's only there uh -huh. because the crows brought him back to life yeah. right which um, makes sense i like her way of yeah, thinking there it's logical it's logical Very you can logical. see where she's going she's yeah just, yeah um so she eric at least leaving... had an iq of 80 that's it. So Eric, believing his vengeance is over, <laughs> shut up, <laughs> um, gives Sarah Shelley's engagement ring, right, so that she's got back, he's got back from the pawnbroker. And as Sarah walks home, Grange, um, Top Dollar's right-hand man, oh. kidnaps her and takes her to an abandoned church where Top Dollar and Micra are waiting through the crow, Eric realizes what's happened. So the crow also gives him visions. Sees it and yeah. And he goes to rescue her. He sees what the crow sees, basically. Exactly. So as Grange the crow flies. as the crow flies. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's so it's so um there's so many metaphors in this film. Um so Grange shoots and wounds the crow. 
sapping Eric of his immortality. So, um, so my house, your house. So he's like the, the crow's wood and he's like, uh, you know, he's, he doesn't have the power because he's invincible before that, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, the sister grabs, so the, the, the lover sister grabs the wounded crow intending to take its mystical power because she's this crazy chick. Um, and she wants to try to sap whatever power the crow has given to Eric yeah. for herself. Um, the crow escapes her but claws her eyes out. <laughs> oh, good crow. Making her fall to her death um, down the, ch- the church's bell tower, oh, which nice. is, a, is an awesome scene. <laughs> Eric confronts Top Dollar on the roof. Many um, people have actually died in a movie by falling down a bell tower, haven't they? <laughs> I know, I know. Or like being pierced on something, you know, falling and then something yeah, goes through their through body. Through a fence, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Eric confronts Top Dollar on the roof, which is really, he's like the maestro of it all. You know, he has like organised the whole thing. So he admits um, ultimate responsibility to Eric's face for his death and Shelley's death. He's or- He ordered the murder as part of a scheme to take over their apartment building for his criminal activity, so, which mm. they sort of, they didn't know exactly, but they knew they were being evicted for no reason. That's why they were trying to and fight it. But that's why. So, so Top Dollar sent that crew to yeah. try to, you know, like kill them to shut them up basically um so eric grabs top dollar transferring the 30 hours of pain he absorbed from oh, outbreak wow. the police sergeant um the sensation causes top dollar to fall from the roof and he's impaled on a gargoyle oh, there you go. killing another... him yes yeah, on a gargoyle yeah. Very poetic as well. Incredibly poetic. Um, so Sarah accompanies um, Albrecht to the hospital, the police chief, because he got shot in the process. Um, the police, police sergeant, sorry. Eric stumbles to the graveyard where he's reunited with Shelley's spirit and returns to the afterlife. His revenge now complete. Very good. Yes. So Ernie Hudson, I mentioned before, you might know him from Ghostbusters, but he's amazing and is so great in this movie. And it's such an old movie, so they're all very young in it too. Like yeah, it's, of course. It's such a great film. Um, the cast all kept in close contact over the years because I've researched them now and they've all managed to stay in touch or at least there's articles about I them guess all being friends. There would be something that after an incident like that that happened that would bring you together, isn't that? Not just from being in a movie, but the tragicness of everything that happened. Because of the tragedy that happened. So before I go on to that, I'm going to talk about the soundtrack. Um, I think it's one of the most, one of my most favourite albums of all time. It's up there with like Dirty Dancing and some of my all-time favourite albums, yeah. Um, And I'd kill to find it on vinyl if I could get it on vinyl. Like I had it on CD. Um, It features songs from artists such as The Cure, Rage Against the Machine. Formerly known as Prince. Stone Temple Pilots. Oh, um, wow. The Cure's not Prince. No, I know. I was saying artists formerly known as Prince. <laughs> Belinda, I think Belinda would like that album too. She loves Stone Temple Pilots and that type of music. Uh, the Violet mm. Femmes is on there, Nine yeah. Inch Nails, and my favourite, you might not know this, um, is a song called It Won't Rain on the Time, um, sung by an artist called Jane Cybrey. I was pretty much obsessed with that song all through high school um, and it plays a big part in the, in the film because most of the film it's him singing it because that was the song on the record that he was about to release. Right. Um, but then a, an, a different artist does the whole song. So the song features in the film at different times, um, but then she sings it from a completely different perspective, like a lady's voice, et cetera, but it's such an amazing song. It's such an amazing album. So remakes apparently there's a brand new one coming out and I've Bill, heard of this. Bill Skarsgård's in it and I love those Skarsgård boys like they are fucking you know they can do anything they're hot as shit um so you know who the Skarsgårds are right yes yeah he's the guy from it it's a guy Alexander so he so Alex Bill's the, Bill's the youngest baby one so he's from it but um Alexander is obviously from True, True Blood. Blood that's where yep. you probably most commonly know him gorgeous specimen of a man and he's also in um big little lies and then there's the dad as well um and then there's the other brother who's married to jake gillenhall's sister oh, um yeah 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 they have children together so the, the, they're like this massive you know um movie royalty sort of family but um so apparently it's in it's been 
in production for a couple of years. Apparently it's finalised cool. and they shopped it out last year to Keynes, but the Keynes Film Festival, but they haven't come back and released it. So maybe no one's picked it up, but I don't know what's happening because I couldn't find anything more on it. Yeah, no, um, I had heard rumours about them redoing it and there's sequels to the original, isn't there? Well, I'm going to go into that. So yeah. in 1996, a sequel was released called The Crow City of Angels. Yes. Um, so it goes along a, a different family and stuff like that, but Sarah the crow thing. Oh, Sarah's in it. A different actor though. Yeah. Um, so she reappears and assists the whole family. Um, Iggy Pop was in it. He was originally mm. asked um to put some songs on the film clip and be part of the first movie, but his scheduling conflicts didn't work out. But he came back, he came into the sequel, but the sequel wow. was a flop. Yes, I can imagine. <laughs> Um, so The Crow Stairway to Heaven was a 1998 Canadian television series. Um, it actually that sounds familiar too. I think I remember there being a TV series of it. It was also a flop. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the Crow Salvation was released in 2000. Jesus. I guess most notably in that film, Kirsten Dunst start. Oh. Um, but it was also a, a flop. flop released. <laughs> Released to mixed reviews. Direct, I would like to see it because I love Kirsten Dunst. Yeah. Yeah, I like her too. Um, so the fourth film, which you're going to love, The Crow Wicked Prayer was released <laughs> in 2005. It stars Edward Furlong, Tara oh, Reid, oh, and God. David Baranas. Jeffersonian Plus. <laughs> Who's, oh, Bones. Bang. Angel. Oh, my God. Angel. Angel. Bones. Bones. Edward Furlong from Terminator fucking 2 and Tara Reid. What a combination. Bones. Um, and let like, me guess, it was a flop. Like the other sequels, it had a poor <laughs> critical reception and it was considered the worst of the four oh, films. God. <laughs> so then The Crow 2037 was a planned sequel written and scheduled to be directed by Rob Zombie in the 1990s. However, it was never made. Um, so in my research, I all also found in 2019 that Jason Moma was supposed to play oh. um, the character of Eric Well, the main lead. I don't know if they were going to create it as Eric Craven. Um, but again, that never seemed to really go ahead. But there's heaps of articles about it happening, but there's nothing to say that it actually happened. Confirmation. Um, anyway, would you like to talk about how he died? Yes, go for it. Okay. So in 1993, Brandon Lee was an up-and-coming action star, even though he didn't want to be. As a son of legendary martial artist Bruce Lee, Brandon Lee had been hesitant to follow in his father's footsteps and wanted to be a dramatic actor instead. But that year, he landed the lead in an action-packed blockbuster. Unfortunately, he was fated to follow his father in more tragic ways too. So his father died from a sudden brain aneurysm? Yes. Um, okay. So, um, like his father, Bruce Lee's son died young and in unforeseen circumstances, but Brandon Lee's death was made all the more tragic by how preventable it was. So do you know much about what happened? I think, was it the, there was meant to be a blank in the gun, but there wasn't? Sort of, yeah, pretty much. Um, so on March 31st, Lee was shot dead in a scene gone wrong on the set of his upcoming film, The Crow, when his co-star fired a prop gun that had a dummy bullet lodged in its chamber. Lee's death was also an eerie case in which art, which life imitated art. The scene that killed him was supposed to be the scene in which his character died. Wow, I didn't so, know that. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So the crew of The Crow had already come to believe that the endeavour was cursed. On the first day of filming, a carpenter was nearly electrocuted. Later, a construction worker accidentally drove a screwdriver through his hand and a disgruntled sculptor crashed his car through the studio's back lot so it's very poltergeist vibes in the curse yeah itself. so they were all like there's a curse on, on this is before he died like they were all like you know there's a curse on this set it's crazy so brendan lee's death was by far the worst omen the crew could have received meanwhile rumors swirled that the bullet was purposely placed inside the prop gun so i remember as a teenager thinking without a doubt that it was a conspiracy and somebody yeah. had murdered him because he was just too good looking and talented. The curse, the curse of the dragon. Yeah. So Eric Draven, the character's death was pivotal 
So the, the character's death was pivotal to his arc in the movie. So the scene in which he dies was saved for the, the later part of the production. Um, it was supposed to be simple. The director intended for Lee to walk through a doorway carrying a grocery bag and co-star Michael Massey would fire blanks at him from 15 feet away. Lee would then flip a switch fitted to the bag, which would activate squibs, small fireworks that simulated bloody bullet wounds. Right. Um, it wasn't the first time they tried the scene. A police spokesperson said after the event, the gun had been made specifically by the props team to simulate realistic rounds. But on the fateful night in March, it was loaded with a dummy bullet from a previous scene. That's right, yes. The gun was only supposed to fire blanks, but that dummy bullet had become lodged inside without anyone noticing. Even though it wasn't a real bullet, bullet the force bullet... I have your help. <laughs> the real bullet, the force in which the dummy was unlodged was comparable to that of a real one. Yeah. When Massey fired unknowingly in the scene, they were full shooting the scene, like cameras rolling. Yeah. You know, he was at the murderer scene. And so you can imagine how much actors would prepare for those types yeah, of yeah, scenes yeah. as well, totally. like the emotion they have to spend. Yeah. And well, look, as as professional actors ourselves, we yeah, know what it takes. We know we know what a head shoot fuck a it scene. is. <laughs> So you can imagine everyone's like right onto it. Um, but so when Massey and fired they unknowingly. they not know if he was acting or what at first. Well, that's the part. So when Massey fired unknowingly, Lee was struck in the stomach and two arteries were immediately severed. So it took them ages to react to what had happened because, because. they thought he was acting. They didn't realise that his reaction was of him being shot properly and actually dying because they thought he was acting in the scene. Because that was Bless the scene. Yeah. yeah. So it took them ages to be like, fuck, he's actually fucking injured. Um, so Lee collapsed on set, was rushed to hospital. Um, he was in surgery for six hours, but he died at 1 4 p.m. on March 31st, 1993. He's actually incredibly good looking, isn't he? Oh, he's gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah. But, um, what, like, the only conspiracy really you could imagine is that maybe someone else wanted the role, like, was jealous. But they're but at even the end, still, yeah. The end of filming, do you know what I mean? It was already been filmed. Like, you're not really going to replace. It's too little, too late. Like, yeah, it's not like you're throwing pearls down on the stage and she's breaking a fucking ankle as she walks Yeah, on. like, where's the motive, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, so. But there's always going to be conspiracy theories around of that. Of course, stuff. of course. And I strongly felt as a 14-year-old. 14, 15 year old that someone had killed him because yes. he was too beautiful. Um, so production on the 14 million action adventure was scheduled to wrap eight days later after, you know, the accident, his death. Um, but they immediately suspended filming and resumed with a stand in for Lee months later. Right. So um, even though police concluded that Brendan Lee's death was an accident, there are theories that Lee was intentionally killed. Um, when Lee's father died, there were similar rumours spread that the Chinese mafia had orchestrated yeah. the incident. These rumours remain just that. Um, another rumour that had persisted is that the crew used a scene in which Lee died in the actual movie. This is false. Instead, CGI was used to help complete the film. So even though they were filming at the moment that he was injured, they didn't use that in the film. Mm -hmm. they, they remade it. They redid Good. it with CGI. Yeah, that's a bit fucking um, cruel. Meanwhile, the actor who fired the fatal, sh fatal shot would never truly recover. And I've seen some documentaries on him and he's like, like he's continued to act later on, but in very, very small yeah. parts. Like you probably know his face if you horrendous. saw him. Yeah. Um, it's like trying to drive again after you've killed somebody, like driven and knocked over a kid or something. Even yeah. if it's not your fault. Yeah. Uh, so The Crow went on to be a commercial success and is considered today to be a cult classic. It was released two months after Brendan Lee's death and a dedication to him was made in the credits. So I believe the budget was about $23 million. Two they months made... after his death, they released mm. it. Jesus, that's quick. I that know. Was... And to know, and I'm going to be cynical here, but I reckon they got it ready and because it usually takes quite a long time after a movie's been filmed and that to be edited and whatnot. I reckon they were cashing in on the fucking look. Uh, you know, bus. anything's possible, really. You could, you could absolutely be a hundred percent on the money there, but, but of course. But yeah, that seems to be very quick. I reckon they were definitely cashing in on the hype. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, but it made like yeah over a hundred million, and 
is still an incredibly popular film, I think, to this day. Like, it you is. Know, it's, as you the, said, it's got a massive cult following. It's like yeah. Greece was for us, you know? Yeah. Where the young kids come up and they're like, you know, let's watch The Crow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Even yeah. though it's a super old film because it's so yeah. cool. And it totally... So if you haven't seen it in years, I strongly, strongly suggest that you watch oh, it. Oh, look, it, so it, has, cool. it has piqued my interest hearing about it. And I think it's something that Vinny would actually enjoy as well. So I think it's something that we could watch as a movie together. Yeah, Because I'm I watching understand. Medium at the moment on yes, my well, own. You can put Medium on fucking hold and catch up on maths, please. Sure, sure, sure. Jesus Christ, we've got a podcast to run <laughs> <laughs> that is heavily circulated around maps at this time of year. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Tragic Pop Culture. Tune in next week as we go back in time. It was tragic, wasn't it? We talked it about a, a lot tragic of tragic. It's a novel, it's so upbeat. <laughs> it is. Dirty Dancing, Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> That was the same episode, plus. Yeah. Uh, remember to rate, share, and subscribe on whatever you listen to our beautiful tales on. And don't forget, if it ain't winning, it's winning. It's whining. What? <laughs> if it ain't winning, it's whining. <laughs> if it ain't winning, it's whining. Or should we say, um, if you're whining, you're winning. If you're whining, you're winning. I feel like you need to keep it all in. Good night, stupid bitches. All right. Good night, you stupid bitches. Good night. <laughs> yeah, that stupid bitch. Mm-hmm. He's a stupid bitch. What a stupid bitch. That stupid bitch.